Welcome to Contemplative Citizenship, a concept we are developing at the Urban Well to help us hold convictions deeply while still reducing division around us. This is a both and we need to develop for the sake of our democracy in an age of social media and disinformation where social and political differences are easily magnified and manipulated. Our belief is that people of faith, particularly when strengthened by contemplative practices, can be usefully present with personal convictions while also seeking to reduce division. In this podcast, a short teaching time is paired with a simple prayer practice. These podcasts on contemplative citizenship features David Peck, priest and pastor in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. His work and perspective on democracy, conflict, and faith is informed by decades of work internationally in strengthening civil society through community-based efforts, as well as humanitarian and diplomatic engagement. And now, here's Father David. It's great to be back after such rich conversations around sin and the Rolling Stones, the media coverage of this series and podcast, and even a road trip this weekend to meet with smaller parishes in rural parts of this swing state to hear what they might want from a series like this. So let's begin this penultimate podcast with Stability of Hope. I'm going to talk about how hope can be both a mystical thing, a liberating thing, and a firm foundation upon which to stand with greater stability and freedom together. Whoever wins the presidency will arguably have not won much. Our Constitution makes it hard for Washington or state houses anywhere to get things done in a country that lacks clear majorities. The current state of the nation, all of our rural and urban divides and so on, are all complicated by gender, age, labor, wealth, education, and so on. But the good news is the North and the South is no longer that classic divide, and race and culture are no longer political destinies. We are also more engaged, if alas, also more enraged, citizens. Our work of seeking to assist and humbly repair a divided and reactive country is urgently needed as contemplative citizens. We feel, of course, frustrated, scared, threatened, and angry, and these are deep and hard emotions to work with, and I think we have to live with and, as a nation, face our serious limitations and powerlessness. Manifestly, we need to think afresh and to think again, but it seems to me that if we are lacking any skill and grace, we need, as citizens of our country and of heaven, it is the skill and grace to think afresh or to think again, to think outside of those stale binary categories of conservative and liberal, Democrat or Republican, left or right, The list goes on. At the end of all the literally billions of dollars spent and all the wounding words, all the truths and all the lies, distortions, exaggerations, and misinformation, we will not have changed very much. We will likely still have ourselves, we will still have our enemies, and we will still have all the problems of America the polarized. This means a debt crisis, an opioid crisis, a mental health crisis, a border crisis, a climate crisis, a Middle East crisis, a Sudan crisis, a Russia crisis. You know the list. A family breakdown crisis, housing crisis, masculinity crisis, and reproductive and sexual health crises. These are just a few of those things that make so clear that there is nothing simple about our civic or our global landscape. And our easy answers are also our most telling lies. It is dismal to think, but it is true, how hard we must do the work of facing what Buddhists describe so well as samsara, 
Samsara is the endless, cyclical, and absurd realm of life, death, and sin, where human behavior consists of clinging, illusion, reaction, repetition, and suffering. It is a kind of shadow world that, in our tragic, deluded state, we make and mistake for real life. In search for new terms, for understanding and fresh thinking, I have found this diagnosis of samsara in the Buddhist tradition and meditating upon it very helpful. I have found some much-needed detachment through the mercy seminars of the urban well. In coming up against samsara as a normative, if degraded, state of human existence, I have a helpful new word to frame an old and important understanding of my Christian theology. Studying outside the Christian tradition a little has helped me to better see and comprehend my experience of sin in the world and in myself. Like the proverbial fish who may not know it is swimming in water, I do not even know my own immersion in sin, that it is the reality in which I swim. I am, however, liberated from such ignorance with glimpses of insight, what in the Christian tradition we call grace, that often gives rise to hope. These graces for me usually come through reading the Bible and in worship, but often in my meditation practice, as well as time in nature, too. In these practices, I am more frequently encountering graces from God that enable some very slow, temporary, and partial self-realization and enlightenment. I think it is changing my preaching and my praying, and hopefully sooner or later will change some of my most unhelpful behaviors and besetting sins. In this work of contemplative citizenship, we have explored the limitations of human suffering and understanding, how theology helps us hold a dual citizenship of earth and heaven, and why, without a thorough understanding of sin, we can deceive ourselves so much that the truth is not in us. So now we are ready to discover what I describe as the stability of hope, and next week the power of compassion too. If in samsara there is no stability because there is not reality, but only illusion and delusion, then I believe the ground of hope is the reality of God. St. Paul says in his first letter to the Thessalonians, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, so that you may not grieve as those who have no hope. So that you may not grieve as those who have no hope. St. Paul spoke those words about how even the experience of the death of someone we love is or can be altered by the reality of hope manifested in our trust in God. The only problem with hope is we have to know what hope is to get the most out of it. Hope is not optimism. It is not naive. It is not vague. In short, in a faith-based context, hope is muscle, bone, and brawn. It is not merely perspective, but is wisdom and even truth itself. We hear in the first letter of Peter that God in his mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Clearly, this claim has all the problems of any truth claim of faith. It lacks, of course, permanent and repeatable material evidence which is why it requires faith, in short, trust, to believe it. But I do have that faith, and it is what I therefore believe and hope and trust to be true. 
We hear in chapter 11 of the Hebrews letter that faith is confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. Very specifically, the hope for which we hope in Christ is for that new and eternal life that is both here and now welling up within us and to be discovered in its fullness in the life of the world to come. So here I take a big leap from the realm of samsara that a Buddhist would easily grasp and start to play a very different Christian soundtrack wherein a realized and living hope in Christ becomes a path out of samsara and the dreariness of original sin into enlightenment. There are distinct parallels with the living Christ and the living Buddha, as Thich Nhat Hanh would say. Hear this. Let the same mind be in you as was in Christ Jesus, St. Paul urges. If Christ is the enlightened one of God, and we are to possess the same mind and grow into the full stature of Christ, then what are we doing shrinking back from the call to the full perfection, our full realization and enlightenment in our faith? Let the same mind be in us as was in Christ. If God exists, then we have every reason to hope for things not yet seen. I have reason to be confident about God's will being done without having to cling to my own will, without having to control things or live steeped in the fear, control, and reactivity of that samsaric world of sin. How new and liberating is the capacity to be able to hope for something without being fixated on the vagaries of any particular outcome. That creates a way of serenity, which allows for a rootedness that is a deep stability without being frozen or inflexible. Cynthia Bourgeau speaks of this as mystical hope, that hope that is rooted in the trust that God is God and will work God's purposes out day by day, year by year, generation by generation, eon by eon. Mystical hope is not hoping I pass the math test or the cancer test. Mystical hope is that whether I have cancer or do not have cancer, I know I am held in the hands of an all-loving and all-merciful God. Mystical hope is anchored in the will of God. The Arabic expression, inshallah, expresses this very well. Inshallah means God willing, of course. It is said both casually and profoundly across the Middle East, whether one is a Christian or a Muslim, in the morning, one might say to a friend, a loved one, or even a business associate, I'll see you this afternoon, inshallah. Yes, good, comes the reply, inshallah. If God wills it, we will meet. We are confident and able, but not ultimately in control. Inshallah reminds us that all reality is willed by God, all things come from God. All occasions and circumstances are invitations to us to put our trust in God and to draw nearer to the One, whether we are in want or in plenty. In this formulaic exchange, the Holy One, who is not only the All-Merciful One, but also the Disposer of all things, comes to us and we. To him. We acknowledge this fleetingly in our Christian liturgy at the presentation of our gifts at the altar, 
when we say, All things come of you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. If we step back from our lives, from the driving, thrusting, elbowing, and overprogrammed nature of our lives, even our children's lives, and the illusion that by rising early and going to bed late we will add a single day to the span of our lives, we are missing something about those three strongest braids of faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love abide. Faith is that strand that teaches us that there is a horizon beyond this one. Hope is the strand that ensures we can grasp that horizon from our head and heart. Love is the strand of that experience as we experience the horizon of our hope and our faith. All our hope on God is founded where we place our hope, then, is the acid test of our faith. As the psalmist says, some put their trust in chariots and horses, but I shall trust the living God. Is our hope and trust on the dead gods of the past, or the false gods of the present, or the one true and living God who holds the whole world in his hands? And here is the practice part. My hope and trust is not a point of last resort, but woven into my daily life, moment by moment. To know who we are and why we are, we must remember whose we are. Of course, there are problems with hope as there are with faith and love. It can elude us. We can become passive or lazy with hope. And this is particularly problematic when there is oppression, violence, or wickedness, and the temptation of our response is a, an unhealthy quietism. All in God's time, or God will take care of it. That kind of passivity in the face of injustice can be an abdication of human responsibility. But as contemplative citizens, our small and quiet, hope-filled responsiveness is not an abdication. It takes account of my limitations without exoneration of my responsibility. Calls for quiet are wrong when there are ways to witness or resist. Dr. Rowan Williams recently reflected on this as he explored the limits of human beings and the finitude, as he calls it, of our souls. We can do what we can do, but only that, and not everything, he says. And that is a good thing. We are relieved, he says, from a delusional position of thinking we have to do everything. I have rarely been shocked as I was when I first heard Rowan Williams say that teachers who tell their students or parents who tell their children that they can do anything are lying. Instead, a loving adult, a caring adult, will help a child navigate and live with the inevitable limitations that they, and we as all human beings must, come across our own and other people's limitations in their lives. He said in an address to school teachers who were teaching meditation in schools, this stark fact that hit me so hard. Now, in his recent address, Rowan beautifully said, those people who reveal to us our limitations, people like beggars whom we encounter in the streets, or spouses, children, teachers, and prophets, can be some of our truest friends, our soul friends, even if they are not always our most welcome ones. Let's now have our prayer practice together, building on what we have been learning in these teachings and practices 
to help us be more contemplative citizens. Today I want to share the practice that brought together Rowan and me and those teachers on that meditation teaching day in London many years ago. It is a practice called mantra prayer. It comes and is beautifully taught and resourced by the world community of Christian meditation and the work of Father Lawrence that builds upon that of Father John Maine. It uses and encourages a single word or a very short phrase that is repeated for the duration of a meditation. It comes from a desert tradition of Christian prayer. In the Christian tradition, mantra prayer is known as pure prayer and comes from the conferences, the teachings of John Cassian early in the church. It's called pure prayer because it releases us from all thoughts and images and words. It allows us to lay aside any distractions other than a focus on a pure openness to the presence of God. To help us with that attention, I invite you to sit up a little taller, ideally on a firm chair, with a slightly lengthened spine and perhaps engaged core, whatever posture suits you to help you feel more alert and relaxed. Just take a few breaths. Perhaps through your nose and out again. Choose a word like Abba or mercy, the word which the World Community for Christian Meditation suggests is Maranatha, Maranatha, four syllables that mean come, Lord, in Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke. Maranatha, or whichever word you choose, repeat it silently interiorly for the whole time of your meditation. It takes time to build up a practice of meditation, so be patient with yourself and don't judge. Just when you become distracted, bring your attention back to the prayer word, and that will be the path that you follow, the pilgrim's path, John Main says, into the center of your being, your heart, and the experience of God at one with it, and Christ who dwells there. The community recommends working towards 20 minutes per day, once in the morning and once in the evening. Heavenly Father, open our hearts to the silent presence of the Spirit of your Son, Lead us into that mysterious silence where your love is revealed to all who call. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Thank you for joining us on this exploration of Contemplative Citizenship. Remember, it's not just about listening, it's about engaging. And don't forget to subscribe and share this podcast with friends. Join us next week as we find new contemplative resources with Father David and the Urban Well team. For more information on this series and the Urban Well, go to urbanwell.org. Until then, keep seeking and keep connecting.